and welcome to uh, our next event in the Heller First 100 Days series. I'm David Weil, the Dean of the Heller School for Social Policy and Management. Uh, and I'm delighted to see so many people join us today for this wonderful event. Um, we've been holding a series of events built around this idea of the first 100 days, which as you know, passed uh, last week. Um, 100 days has almost taken on this magical quality as a benchmark of a president's agenda and ability to move that agenda. And certainly the Biden administration uh, no exception to looking at these initial days as crucially important to, to the work they want to do in a whole realm of areas. Um, and has and President Biden himself has often invoked um, the originator of this idea of 100 days, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, who at the time of the Great Depression articulated these early moments as crucial ultimately to the nation and the policies to be achieved. Um, a, a clear example of one of those areas of critical social policy is obviously healthcare. And the challenges of providing quality and comprehensive healthcare in a cost effective manner has been with us for decades. Um, the complexities of doing so have only grown over time as science and technology have improved so society's ability to diagnose and manage a range of diseases and chronic illnesses. At the same time, we have come to understand the disparities in health outcomes that reflect profound variance in exposures as well as access to treatment. The pandemic has certainly sharpened a public awareness of the promises and challenges facing our healthcare system. For example, we cracked the code of the virus and then develop vaccines at an unprecedented rate. Yet we also know from public health data that exposure to COVID, access to care and distribution to the vaccine reflects the same set of disparities we've been wrestling with for some time in social policies. Uh, and as in other areas of public and so social policy, the onus on researchers in trying to assist and like the Biden administration in its early days, is to, on one hand, undertake rigorous analysis that opens our understanding of underlying problems, but doing that in ways that are actionable through policy creation and policy implementation. Our speaker today, Stuart Altman, the Saul Chaikin Professor of Health Policy and the co-director of the Schneider Institutes for Health Policy and Research, has been a central player in parsing the healthcare system for five de decades. His distinguished career has been unique as both a leading researcher in the healthcare arena and someone deeply involved in the crafting of health systems policies. Now time, uh, nor Stewart does, permits me uh, uh, well enough time to give uh, his record justice, but I think indicative is the fact that Stewart has acted as an advisor to five US presidential administrations. In more recent years, he served as the chair of the Institute of Medicine's Committee for the Evaluation of the Future of Nursing Campaign for Action. Uh, and in January 2016, uh, Governor Charlie Baker of Massachusetts reappointed Stewart to chair the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission. Uh, as part of uh, our state's attempt to moderate the growth in healthcare spending. So obviously no one is really better positioned to discuss the challenges of the first hundred days and beyond for the Biden administration in the area of health policy than Stewart. To get us started, I'm also very pleased to introduce my colleague, Professor Connie Horgan. Connie is the co-director of the Schneider Institutes for Health Policy and Research with Stewart as well as the founding and current director of its Institute for Behavioral Health. Along with these leader roles, Connie has done breakthrough research focused on how alcohol, drug and mental health services are financed, organized and delivered in the public and private sectors and what approaches can be used to improve the quality and effectiveness of the delivery system. Once again, I'm delighted to have you with us today 
And let me turn it over now to Professor Connie Borden. Thank you, David, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is truly an honor to be introducing our speaker today, Dr. Stuart Altman. Um, I have just a little bit more to add to the wonderful introductory remarks that our Dean um, David Weil um, has given. Um, but Stuart is so well known at the Heller School and beyond um, that there is almost no need to do an introduction um, of Stuart, as he's already pointed out to me a few minutes ago. But we couldn't let the moment pass without um, a little bit more expansion um, on, um, on the breadth of what he is bringing um, to us uh, to speak on today. Um, and um, we, we've heard that he has been an advisor to five US presidential administrations, including the current one, which makes him even more appropriate for um, uh, today's um, uh, talk. I'll give a few statistics because his, um, his knowledge and expertise has been um, acknowledged by, um, by many. Um, he certainly is the recipient of many awards and, and um, accolades far too numerous to mention here, but um, he has been recognized many times by health affairs and modern health care. In 20, 2006, he was voted among the 30 most influential people in health policy over the past previous 30 years. So that is a very precise um, honor that you have to have had 30 years experience and have had hit the mark in all 30 years. So that is our Dr. Altman. He's also been named numerous times to be the top 100 most powerful people in healthcare by modern healthcare. Um, in addition to his renown in the um, area of policy advice and expertise, uh, Stuart is an extremely popular professor with both graduate students and undergrads and teaches classes in national health policy. He did serve as the Dean of the Heller School twice um, in 1977 to 1993 and again in 2005 and 2008. And he also has had the experience of being the interim president of Brandeis for um, a few years in the 1990s. So I will just um, make the point that Stuart is indeed a legend. I have personally worked with him for over 30 years and have benefited from his advice and wisdom. Clearly, there is no one better to speak on our topic today than Dr. Stuart Altman. Now it is my utmost pleasure to introduce our legend, Dr. Stuart Altman. Stuart, take it away. Well, uh, thank you. If somebody would be nice enough to unmute my screen, that would be great. <laughs> it's all right. Well, I was getting embarrassed when people introduced me. And I don't know, the older I get, the more I get embarrassed, I guess. Um, Anyway, it really is good to be here and to be part of the Heller School's 100 uh, day uh, bonanza of different uh, speakers. So I'm going to focus my energy uh, on the area of healthcare. And um, focus first on the pandemic and its impact on utilization patterns in healthcare and then switch gears and focus on what's been happening in, in the Biden health agenda and what we could look forward to potentially as the, uh, <clears throat> as the months go by. Um, there really are four, three areas that, uh, uh, are really important. Obviously the COVID pandemic and what the Biden administration has done to speed up vaccinations and to wherever possible um, minimize the impact of those who've gotten the terrible pandemic. Um, so I'm gonna leave that one alone not because it's so not important, but because we all know a lot about it. 
and focus more on the second and third area, uh, expanding coverage and reducing the uninsured uh, or, and the new insurance options in terms of the Biden. But I will talk about the pandemic in a general sense about its impact on utilization. As uh, our Dean David Weil indicated, um, we've known for a long time that um, healthcare utilization, healthcare outcomes, social issues are not evenly divided in this country and minorities in particular are hardest hit. Um, David pointed that out, but here are just a few statistics which sort of bring this unfortunate situation home. If you look at the COVID death rates, you'll see overall where we had about 630 uh, deaths per 100,000. When it comes to Hispanics and Latinos, it was over 1,000. For American Indians and Alaskan Natives, it was 966. And for Black Americans, it was 900, as opposed to whites, which was a little over 560. When you get to a more focused effort here in Massachusetts, and I want to acknowledge here many of the statistics I will mention in terms of Massachusetts were developed by my uh, very close associates at the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission. Um, the HPC, as it's known here in Massachusetts, has been given the task of providing a very detailed analysis to the state legislature on the impact of COVID on the health system. And so I've borrowed a few of their slides and I hope they won't mind my using some of them today. This shows one of them. If you look at these two age groups and look at inpatient hospital admissions and compare those from COVID to general, you'll notice that where the white population, the blue represents uh, overall admissions. And you'll see that the orange is significantly lower, indicating that COVID had a, a slower impact on the whites. But when you look at Hispanics and Blacks, you'll notice that the orange is much higher than the blue, indicating that in both cases, admissions to the hospitals from the COVID pandemic were greater. Another way to look at it is based on the income of the individuals. And again, at the low end of the economic scale, the orange line, which is the COVID admissions are significantly higher than the blue, where in the higher income groups, you see the reverse of where the orange is less. Again, a different slice of the important, the fact that COVID is disproportionately impacted on our um, on our minority population. Oh, by the way, as I'm moving along, if somebody has an important question they want to, I'll try to stop and answer it. If not, hopefully we'll have a little time at the end. So overall, let's take a look at what impact uh, the COVID pandemic had on utilization. Very interesting slide. This shows the percent change in terms of visits from the baseline, which was the first several months in 2020. And you'll notice there, the different regions were all about the same at the baseline. Then we saw this very sharp decline in March and April, and slowly it began to come out back. And what's interesting in this slide is that in all parts of the US, the utilization patterns by the fall uh, reached the baseline. And actually in the case of the South Central region is now above the baseline. Interestingly, uh, my colleague Rob Mechanic has done a special analysis 
using Medicare utilization data. And while the regional data I showed you showed it coming back and that all the regions were the same, when he analyzed it by city, you'll notice that's not the case. Uh, whereas the, in Houston, Texas, the blue, eight, they um, fell more, um, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, and then they declined faster and stayed below where uh, in Milwaukee, uh, they began, uh, the admission rates came back much more uh, than what happened in Houston. So again, for those of you who are doing research or interested, if you take a broader regional issue uh, or a slice, you'll notice that they look about the same, but you could see significant differences if you hone in on regions. When we look at uh, the kinds of illness that had the biggest impact, interestingly enough, not surprising, pediatrics have had the greatest decline during COVID. Um, and not behavioral health, since many of you are behavioral health analysts, um, had actually one of the larger declines for the year, about 10%. On the other hand, when you look at rheumatology or urology or adult medicine, actually overall, they saw increases during the, during the pandemic. One of the interesting things that is probably going to shape the future of healthcare utilization is the, is the use of telehealth. Telehealth is here to stay. If you look at this slide, you'll notice that there was, a very, again, a very sharp increase in the March, April, May period. And while the increase, now we're talking about increase now, declined. Um, it stayed around 7% throughout the remainder of the pandemic. Whereas, as I mentioned before about behavioral health, the big use of telehealth has been and continues to be in behavioral health. I will leave it to my expert colleagues, particularly Connie and her staff to explain why, but my sense is it's a combination of the shortage of providers in the area and the need to, to provide greater efficiency on one side and the fact that behavioral health specialists have found that it actually helps sometimes in the use of telehealth. Um, now, when we sort of pull all of this together and look at total spending, you'll see again that there was sharp declines, particularly in the use of physicians in orange and in hospital care in this green. But by June and July, many of the uh, patterns of spending had come back to baseline. In the area of home health and in prescription drugs, beginning around August, actually spending began to grow beyond the baseline. What's interesting here, for those of you who focus on the agent, is that the use of nursing home care declined sharply again in April, but really never came back. And overall, by the end of the year, we're still down almost 8%. Hospital care on the, was down around 3, 7, and physician care, as I said, came back and was just a little decline. I think we're going to be looking at a changing use of nursing homes as we move into the future. One area of particular concern to me and those of us who focus on the cost of healthcare and the fact that over the last five to 10 years, much of the growth in healthcare spending 
has been the result of price increases is this slide. Throughout the period beginning in, our, in the beginning of 2018, you see that the growth has been fairly consistent between two and 3%. But towards the end of 2020, we've seen a very sharp increase in prices charged to commercial insurance. Of course, government and Medicare and Medicaid are able to control their spending rate, but less so for the commercial side. Now, this is troubling in many ways. What it will do is build into the base a much higher price. And if this spike continues, we could see a very rapid growth in healthcare costs or well, more importantly, I like to call it healthcare spending, which will cause significant problems, particularly for people who have trouble meeting their commercial premiums. Excuse me, Stuart, a couple quick questions. Um, was the nursing home utilization just for long-term care or did it combine that with post-acute care? You know? I think they're focusing particularly on nursing home care. The home care rate, as I showed you before, has actually come up. And not all of that is for aged people. But I think what we're talking about, particularly, Michael, is the, is the use of the nursing home. Right, right. Stuart, do you, was the utilization slides, did they include telehealth in those? Yes. They did? OK, yes, thanks. They did. Yeah. Yes, they did. And as a matter of fact, uh, as I'll show you, well, I don't have them here. If you take the telehealth out, the, the, uh, in, the return to the baseline would not have been nearly as dramatic. Makes sense, thanks. Great. So again, let me focus a bit on Massachusetts because we have some very interesting data. Um, let me again turn to mental health. Again, you'll see that where overall behavioral health, mental health and substance abuse was averaging around 15,000 emergency room visits in the early part of, through most of 2019, it declined sharply again, as we've seen in April, May. And while it came back somewhat, it's still substantially below the visits in 2019. Here's the chart with telehealth where uh, office visits did see an increased use of telehealth. That growth declined as we moved through 2020 as did specialty, but professional behavioral health visits stayed up high. And as uh, Mike Dunan talked about, these are numbers are baked into the overall statistics. This is a rather interesting slide. The blue represents telehealth and the orange represents in-person for uh, behavioral health in Massachusetts. And again, you see that very sharp decline in the orange and then it stays low where the blue, the telehealth grows rapidly in April and stays high. So I think we're seeing a permanent change in the behavioral health utilization patterns. Now, those of us in the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission and many of us in Massachusetts of quite interested, not surprisingly, in the overall margins or profits, some would say, of our hospitals. So this special analysis done by the HPC staff shows some very interesting patterns. First of all, the gray line represents what we call teaching hospitals, non-academic teaching hospitals. These are hospitals that do teaching, but are not our big uh, Boston-based academic. 
And you'll notice that their margins stayed high, grew actually in 2019, but declined, but still stay positive in 2020. On the other hand, when you look at the green, which represents our general community hospitals, again, it showed a positive number in 2019 and a very sharp decline in 2020. And I'll explain that in more detail in a minute. Um, our academic our academic health centers in, um, in blue, again, saw some decline, and, but then a bounce back by the end of 2020. Look at this slide. This represents the margins in our four type of hospitals. The square light blue represents margins, including government payments the blue circle, dark blue, represents margins without the government help. First of all, you'll notice that in all cases, the blue circles are below the squares, indicating the differential is how much specially earmarked money from the federal government to hospitals helped them in margins. It particularly helped our so-called teaching hospitals, non-academic. And actually, had it not been for government help, our community hospitals would have seen a significant decline in margins. Now, this is very troubling at many different levels. We at the HPC believe it's very important for the health care system in Massachusetts that we have a vibrant community hospital system. And, we're, and if we don't have any more government help, and even if utilization bounces back a little bit, our community hospitals could be in, in continued problems. So we're gonna have to monitor that very closely. Let me switch gears to um, coverage during COVID. Not as we'll see in the next slide. As many individuals, millions actually, lost their jobs, they also lost their employer-based health insurance. And you notice in this dark blue line, the overall numbers of members of individuals who were insured by commercial, that's both individuals and individuals who were insured through their employer, declined by over 133,000 members. Medicare continued to grow and that's in this light orange. But the big impact, and fortunately we had it, is that as people lost their job and lost their health insurance, they increasingly turned to our Medicaid program, which saw an increase of over 156,000 members during 2020, or a growth rate of 11.4%. So- Rick I mean, Stewart, where's the Accountable Care Act, the Commonwealth Care in this? So the Commonwealth care falls into two categories. A, a, a big chunk of it's in Medicaid. Right, right. And then the others are, um, are in, the, um, are in the, uh, the commercially insured subsidized. And they are listed in this blue line. So in this particular case, I'm going to show you another slide in more detail. So th they're listed in the in the dark blue, but they're not broken out. Thanks. Um, so um, I didn't put it in here, but you you would see that oh, the biggest decline within that group 
were uh, individuals who were insured through uh, smaller companies. Um, and uh, the ones who were insured through the, um, the Affordable Care Act uh, did see some growth. So let me stop for a second and see if there are any other questions on the slides that focus on COVID before I turn to the Biden health agenda in terms of coverage. Give me time to have a drink. It's water. <laughs> Too bad, but it's water. Okay. Now, um, I will admit, I'm a big fan of the Affordable Care Act. Um, Wait, uh, Stuart, yeah. Stuart, can you can you hold on for one sec? There was one question. Sure. Um, what do you think is driving the big jump in the hospital prices? Why are they increasing their prices? Oh yeah. Well, I can I I know why. Well, if you looked at those margins, it was clear to hospitals that they can't count on the government coming in and bailing them out going forward, and they weren't happy with the the lower margins. And so they were determined to get their profitability back up. And they can only do so much on the utilization. And so what did they focus on? What they've been focusing on for the last 10 years, which is to raise their prices. In other words, the raising of the prices was designed to bring their margins back up to where they think they want them to be. It has all kinds of implications for those of us who want to slow the growth in healthcare costs, because hospitals and others, not surprisingly, um, are going to try not to see it happen. Uh, all right, not, all right, Stuart. What is an appropriate margin for hospitals? What do you think? Yeah, uh, if I was running a hospital, I would think, oh, <laughs> five to seven percent. <laughs> I think. I'm not against hospitals, you know, getting their colo. The, the whole issue about margins in hospitals is really not the right issue. It's what they spend because you could have no margins, but have a gigantic cost structure. Um, and one of the things that um, some not-for-profits do, they say, oh, my, our margins are much less than the for-profits. But it's, it's, it's not the margins, it's what's the cost look like? And do we need to have the cost structure that has developed over the years in our healthcare system? That's where the money is. It's not in the margins. Although, let's face it, a lot of groups in healthcare make a lot of money and their margins are significant. So- Thank, thank you, Stuart. Uh, answer that question isn't so easy. Okay? Yep. All right. So as I was saying, uh, I, I am and continue to be a big fan of the Affordable Care Act and believe that it had very substantial positive impact on the healthcare system. I'm going to show you the statistics and slides in a minute. But Overall, it reduced the uninsured rate from about 18% to just above 10%. In most states in the United States, it expanded Medicaid. However, as I'm gonna show you, even under the Affordable Care Act, it left high, um, it left many people, thousands if not millions, of Americans with high premiums and significant cost sharing. This is particularly true of what I would call the lower middle class and small businesses. So let me give you in, in graphics what I'm talking about. So here represents the uninsured rate. And you'll notice that in 2010, we were over 46 million approaching 18% of our popul adult population. 
non-elderly. Passage of the Affordable Care Act really in 2010, it didn't really take effect until 2013, 14. You see a very significant decline in the uninsured rate. And by 2016, it was about 26.7 million down from the 46 and 10%. This is when President Trump took over with a clear uh, desire to destroy the Affordable Care Act. He couldn't quite get away with it, but he did throw a lot of roadblocks and changes. And you see, beginning in 2016, 17, 18, and 19, a growth from 26 to almost 29 million uninsured and a growth in the uninsured rate from 10 to almost 11%. Now, I think you all know this, but let me remind a few of you anyway, that the Supreme Court, when it ruled that the Affordable Care Act was constitutional, made what some of us believe was an, a very uh, surprising and not very pleasant ruling that basically said that states had the authority that if they wanted, they could hold on to the old Affordable Care Act, uh, Medicaid program and not expand. And I think Mike, you would agree with me, Mo and every one of us expected you have a choice. If you wanna be part of the Medicaid program, you have to be part of the Medicaid program and the new Medicaid program, given the Affordable Care Act require expansion. Supreme Court said no. And uh, as a result, a number of states, particularly those in the South, including some with a lot of uninsured in Texas and Florida, for a variety of reasons, we can go into them, said no. But one of the things I want to show you, if you look at the map, this is the map of what it looked like at the end of 2013. And you notice that there's a lot more orange particularly in the Midwest and uh, sort of uh, towards the Northwest in Montana and Wyoming and Idaho. But again, to go back to this slide, you'll notice that most of those states did decide so that we are and were reducing the number of states that have chosen not to expand. And as I'm gonna show you in a second, under the Biden agenda, he is working hard to see if we can eliminate all of these states. Um, Stuart, we, we got a question in the chat about the racial and ethnic makeup of the uninsured. Yes. Um, so I have a slightly different flow of it. Um, I'd have to come up with another slide. I do know, I and mean, I've used it many times, that the uninsured rate is significantly higher, again, like I showed you before, for minorities, Blacks, Hispanics in particular. Hispanics have been the hardest hit. Yeah, I know I women, women in general were hit a lot harder by this uh, economic downturn. Oh, you're talking about just in the COVID. Um, yes, no question about it. Women were particularly hard hit because they tend to focus, they, their jobs were often uh, in industries like hospitality, which were uh, much harder hit during COVID. Absolutely. Hey, um, Stuart, there, there's a question about the premium subsidies in the American Rescue Plan, but I think you're going to get to that in a little bit, right? I am. Okay. And if I don't answer that question, please ask it. Okay, but let me just, I was particularly looking at um, breaking down the uninsured. This is before um, uh, COVID. Of the 29 million, a lot of people said, oh, we don't care about the uninsured. They're just all these blankety blanks, um, undocumented, depending on your own uh, political persuasion what term you use. 
turns out that about 11% of the 29 million or somewhat over 3 million were in that category of undocumented. The biggest numbers were individual, and this is important, these were individuals who were eligible for subsidies under the Affordable Care Act, but they found that the subsidies weren't uh, large enough to allow them to get insurance. So even though they were being subsidized, they still had to pay it. An, an, um, a smaller number were ineligible, about 12%. And interestingly enough, even though I talked about the non-expansion states, there actually were more uninsured in the expansion states. Again, having to do more with the high cost. So not, and this is important because the people who were advising um, Senator Biden, Vice President Biden, again, before he became president, or even during the transition was saying, the one thing you have to do is to substantially lower the costs that subsidized people have to pay. And, and I was one of those people. And I thought it would take a long time and it would be a bitter fight. But I have to tell you, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 in one full swoop did more to improve the Affordable Care Act in terms of coverage than ever I expected. So let me now go through them. Now this is the write-up and you can have these slides. I'm not gonna, because I wanna show it graphically. I think it makes the case. What it tended to do was to help individuals who were being subsidized. Let me show this slide because I think it shows it very dramatically. The blue represents what the world looked like under the Affordable Care Act, but before the uh, Recovery Act. You'll notice even for the lowest income populations, they had to pay four to almost 10% of their income, even after they were subsidized. This is the reason why those numbers I showed you showed the uninsured rate among subsidized. So that was a problem and it was done, and I'm glad to talk about it in, in classes in the Affordable Care Act because, to keep the cost of that program from uh, going out of sight. However, the biggest problem for many, bad as this was for the people who were being subsidized, was for people who were earning a little over the subsidy rate, earning around $51,000, not a gigantic sum. Look what happened to the percentage of their income they would have to pay to get coverage. In other words, if you think about an insurance plan for an individual costing eleven to twelve thousand dollars, they would have to pay twenty percent of their income. Yes, this number comes down, and the only reason it comes down is their income goes up. But we're still talking about eighteen percent, fifteen percent, fourteen percent. It's this group. I'm sorry. I hit the button. Um, it's this group that became very anti-Affordable Care Act. And I call them became the shock troops for those who wanted to destroy the Affordable Care Act. They were what I would call low middle class, some of whom were working, many of whom in small businesses. Look at what happened in the, in the Recovery Act very dramatic, the orange line. Among the low income people that are being subsidized, look at this, people earning 20,000, essentially no premiums, people earning 25, less than 2% rather than six. But look what happens for the group just above the cutoff point, 
there's now a frozen percentage of 8.5%. Look at the gap between the 20% and the 8%. I'm going to show it to you in a little different way. My view, well, it's more than my view, is that you're going to see a sizable reduction in the number of uninsured, particularly in low-income minority populations that really want to be covered, but this will allow them to be covered. You can see it in these slides. The Affordable Care Act, and this is the Recovery Act. Again, if you're about 100% of poverty, no premium. The blue represents premium. Again, 150% of poverty. In the ARP, no premium as opposed to the blue in the ACA. And even as you move up to 400% of poverty, yes, there is a, a, a premium, but it's less. Now, this is for a 40-year-old who is buying insurance. The gap is even greater when you look at a 64-year-old who's somewhat above the poverty uh, 400% of poverty. Under the ACA, for example, and you're 64, you would have had to pay almost 13,000 to buy insurance. Now you have to pay less than just a little over $4,000. A very sizable change in government help for the low income populations and the low income. So that was the good news. The not so good news is that these changes are only for two years. So I think we're gonna to have to work hard to make them permanent. And the reason why they're two years is that it was done in connection with the, um, with the special provision under reconciliation. Okay, let me get on to the end. The other part that's going to be a big debate going forward is whether we're going to expand the role of government to ensure the Americans, the people, and particularly in a so-called public option or Medicare for all. When we did the Princeton conference, we showed this slide. I want to show it again. This was done by the Kaiser Family Foundation. They noticed before the election that a majority of Americans were supportive of thinking about Medicare for all. Very few Republicans, it was mostly in Democrats and independents. And even a larger percentage were in favor of a public option. Upwards of 70% said they either were strongly in favor of it or mildly in favor of it. Even Republicans showed much more support for the public option. Now, here's a good news, bad news argument, depending on which way you're looking at this. If you want to control healthcare costs, I've said this before, somewhat kidding, but not kidding. What most countries do, and the best way to control costs is to control spending. If you don't spend the money on healthcare, you don't spend the money on healthcare. And that's what other countries do. It's not that they're more efficient. It's not that they're not as sick as we are. What they do is they limit the amount of money and they force the healthcare system to live with a shrinking or shrunken budget. And that forces the healthcare system to find efficiencies to live with that. In America, we've allowed the healthcare system to grow in what it wants to grow at. And even with the reductions put on by Medicare and Medicaid, the healthcare system ran around it and just, as I pointed out before, raised their spending from the commercially insured. So if we were to decline or eliminate private insurance or substantially modified, 
again, the uh, Kaiser people did a study and they said, if we eliminated private insurance, what you would see is a decline of from 860 billion spent by private insurance to a little over 500 billion or a decline of over 350 billion. So this is a good news, bad news. If you believe that we should really cut back on healthcare costs, which means healthcare spending, no better way of doing that than to sort of move to government rates and force the system to live with it. I will admit that I'm on the conflicted because on the one hand, I believe we should cut back on the amount of money, but this decline is actually, to say the least, very steep. And I have trouble understanding what our healthcare system could possibly look like if it faced such a large decline. So again, it's good news, bad news, depending on how you look at this future. And I asked this question, and I think it's a mixed area, and I'll show you in a minute. Do Americans really want a healthcare system with significant, and I want to emphasize, de significant declines in revenue? So you see this in this slide. Attitudes toward a public option can be swayed by arguments. When they ask people, are you in favor of a public option which will help drive costs down because they would compete with private, 75% said yes. However, if it causes doctors and hospitals to be paid less, it drops to 53%. And if you actually put it in a negative, leads to too much government, you actually get a majority against it. So it really depends on, it shows how Americans are conflicted on this issue. I do want to say one thing and then I'll stop. How the public option is designed, and again, we haven't seen the Biden people. President Biden or uh, Vice President Biden when he was running, said he wants a limited public option where only people who are uninsured or in the, um, in the uh, plan for, um, uh, for the subsidies uh, would be eligible. But there are a lot of people who want the public option to be available to all. And then the second issue is, what will the public option pay providers? It'll be, will it be like other insurance companies and pay them what the insurance companies pay? Or will it use government power and pay them say Medicare rates? And then you get the kind of cuts that I talk about. So we haven't seen yet, but I do believe that there's a good chance in the next hundred days of the Biden administration, this issue, particularly of the, the public option will play out in a much bigger way. Um, the other issue, which is getting some credit, credence, is whether we lower the age of Medicare. Again, um, there's a lot of support for it. However, the Medicare trust fund is in danger. And if you add a group into the Medicare program, but don't add any more money into the trust fund, through higher taxes or uh, general revenues, the Medicare trust fund could be in serious shape. I don't see that happening in the short run, but again, it is an area, to, again, to reduce the number of uninsured. So let me stop now, um, and we got about five or 10 minutes for comments or questions. All right, all right, Stuart, can you talk about prescription drug costs? Is anyone talking yeah. about that now? So, Thanks, Michael. I left off the, the cost containment stuff, although it's near and dear to my heart. Um, up to this point, the Biden administration has not been willing to put that in. In today's paper, actually, um, uh, Congresswoman Pelosi and the House are pushing for it very hard. Um, 
I I don't I think it will it probably pass the house. I don't see it happening in the short run. I definitely don't see it happening in the Senate. And I think the reason why Biden didn't put it in, first of all, you really can't do it in the reconciliation. So we would have to get not only all his Democratic the senators, but he'd have to get the 10 Republican senators. So um, I think he's chosen to fight other battles first. And let me let me mash up a couple questions here from the chat, Stuart. So somebody's saying, you know, how willing are we as a nation to explicitly ration care? But then another person is saying, you know what, Stuart, you know, why don't we just get rid of the huge administrative costs and pharmacy, pharmacy profits and, and commercial industry profits and, and get rid of the, the fraud, waste and abuse in the system. It's not, it's not just the price, it's these other things, Stuart. I've looked at that up and down. So you're right. If we would eliminate private insurance, along with eliminating it, we would be able to reduce administrative costs. Um, however, it, it, that's not enough. Um, the administrative costs aren't, uh, you wouldn't eliminate all administrative costs. As you begin to insure more people from the government, the government's costs would grow. And by the way, government is, and I work for government a lot, and uh, the government indirectly generates a lot of administrative costs you don't see them on the government side, but you go into the average hospital and ask them how much money they're spending uh, getting their DRG payment rates up to speed or how they're dealing with all the government rates. So this idea we're gonna eliminate administrative costs and save all this money, the answer is yes. Is it enough by itself that all of the reduction is gonna go away? No, it isn't. Oh, okay, the other end of the spectrum there, what about rationing? Why don't we just explicitly ration care here, Stuart? Well, I mean, I'd ask the group, how many of you are in favor of rationing and, and uh, who's gonna get rationed? Um, again, we've been, we live in a world where the healthcare system has been so well funded and we still have problems with minority populations not getting the same amount. If all of a sudden we went to rationing, as we saw in the beginning of the vaccination, do you think the high income people are gonna accept the same thing as the low income people? Um, in every country where there's rationing, uh, the well-to-do do better. Now, um, I don't think this country is, has, well, listen, any country can get used to rationing. We're not that different than other countries. You just go north to Canada. We talk about Canada. Canada has some significant rationing going on. They do it in a rational way, but it takes you, you try to get a, if you have a hip problem or a knee problem, you can wait for a year or two up in Canada. Now they won't ration really, um, uh, life-saving care. So, um, and pe pe people would say we're already rationing to the low income. So there's no question if we pull out $300 billion or so out of the healthcare system, even if we save some of it in administration, there would be rationing going on. Um, I think we would accept some of it, yeah. but for those of in the Health Policy Commission, we're trying to figure out the sweet spot. How can we lower spending but not have rationing? Tricky. Okay, final final question, final thought from you. Hey, Stuart, there are a, a lot of, of your fans who are, who are listening to this, a lot of people that work at Schneider, and I just want to say thank you. Thanks for all you do. Thanks for your insight. This was really fabulous and excellent. Oh. Um, so a, 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 last question, give Biden a grade. How do, you, how do you think he's, he's done? So you and I had this discussion. I gave him a B plus. <laughs> You're the easier grader. You gave him an A minus. 
Um, and the more I thought about it, um, you know, I would have liked to seen him take on the uh, prescription drugs. Um, so if you take the broader picture, I think he's done great. I think the uh, Recovery Act was fantastic. But I, you know, I'm on the group that you've mentioned. I would have liked to have seen him take on cost containment a little more. So I'm going to stick with my B plus. Okay. Well, well, on behalf of everyone, Stuart, thank you very much. Thank you. It's wonderful to talk to you. And thank you, Michael, for the questions.